Welcome to Friday here on the North Shore Drive podcast on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We got Adam Bittner talking Steelers. Which Steelers do we think could make their first Pro Bowl this season and which might be in line for all pro? We'll talk about that and another crazy performance from Paul Skeens. We talked to Andrew Destin, Destin on the Pirates beat. It's going to be a fun episode. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Adam Bittner, where, as always, we come to you on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, talking about all your favorite sports topics uh, here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Um, and as always, the show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, they have over 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap. Uh, they're right across the street from PNC Park in the North Shore. It's an amazing place to go. More on them later. Adam, it's that time of the year where we're doing a lot of speculation and we're doing we're getting ready. But, hey, training camp is just less than, I think, less than two weeks away now. So, there's a lot of excitement about seeing some of the new players, but also seeing some of the players that people are expecting to take a big step up this year. So let's do this today. I wanted to go over players that we look at on both sides of the ball. We'll start with offense, who we think could make their first Pro Bowl this season if they have that kind of a step up year. So, Adam, I want you to lead this off because on offense, the only people that have really made Pro Bowls Russell Wilson, we know it has because you know he, he was he had his time and he's been in the NFL forever. But Najee Harris has made a Pro Bowl, but pretty much everybody else has not, which is kind of interesting when you look at that, and it gives you a wide range of talents that you can kind of go back and forth about. Yeah, and I think this is an important topic because um, you know when you look at the teams that are in the Super Bowl at the end of the year, they they are the teams that tend to have five, six, seven guys, and if the Steelers are going to be a team that takes that next step and, and, you know, becomes a serious contender for a championship, you're going to need some of these guys to be, you know, be performing at a pro bowl level. And, you know, sometimes I think we say pro bowl and we maybe have a higher idea of, of what that means. Lots of guys can make pro bowls these days. Um, you know, it's, it's not that high a bar, especially because some guys will say, ah, I'm not going, I'm not right. going to play dodgeball. So I'm, I'm backing out of this. So then another guy gets a call who maybe, um, so I think some of the cachet has been lost, but nevertheless, I think when you're looking at it from a team building perspective, it's rare that you're going to see a Super Bowl champion or a Super Bowl qualifier that's going to have like two Pro Bowlers, right? Um, and so that's why, especially on the offensive side, some of these guys are probably going to have to step up so that you have two, three Pro Bowlers on the offensive side, and then maybe two, three on the defensive side um, to be looked at as, as a serious contender. So um, you know, I, I think the the first person you look at to potentially be a first time Pro Bowl is George Pickens, right? Yeah, um, he's the man now. There's there's no one in front of him. Um, you know, the the big targets are coming to him. You know, I think the big question, and Paul and I were talking about this on our podcast um, on Thursday when we were kind of going through some prop bets, was is he going to get enough targets and enough opportunity in this Arthur Smith offense? Um, and and are there going to be you know I'll, I'll add this to that are there going to be enough guys drawing coverage off of him and they're going to I you know identify and have a solid number two um, where where he's you know got the room with the coverage to, to make some plays I think that's going to be the big question for him this season I think there's a, that's definitely one of the big questions this season how does he work with the new quarterbacks how does he progress in his and it's again we talked with Zach Azani the Steelers wide receivers coach about the details that he's trying to pull out of George Pickens games trying to sharpen his footwork get him to be do those little things those are the things that I think could be really interesting to see if he puts together I'll go with another pass catcher for the Steelers that's Pat Fryermuth who you and I when we were talking about this we both thought oh he's probably made a pro bowl and he hadn't and you know I think it's kind of you know when you when you look at his stats, you're like, oh well, okay, that does kind of make sense because he really just had his rookie year where he, you know, caught like seven touchdowns, and since then he's only cut two touchdowns a season. Um, but part of that's just because been because of the Steelers' offense and the play, the place that it's been in. He's had he had old man Ben Roethlisberger, he had uh, Mitch Trubisky and Kenny Pickett, and then Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph, and you know he really hadn't been a you know been, been put in a position to take over a lot of games and. 
that's where I think it could be really interesting if the Steelers could get him involved more. What could that even look like statistically wise? Because you go back to 2022 and Kenny Pickett's rookie season, he had 732 yards and uh, you know to, you know he only two touchdowns, but that was a lot of that was a lot of receiving yards. If Russell Wilson can get him going and I, it makes me wonder, could he be a thousand yard tight end? If you're in the thousand yard tight end conversation, then you are in in, in the Pro Bowl considerations because then you're making more plays. You're getting where you, people are going to notice that a little bit more. I think that along with George Pickens, if this offense does take a step forward, like people are expecting it to uh, with Arthur Smith and just with Russell Wilson and just being by if nothing else better than what Matt Canada and, and the previous quarterbacks were, I could see something that happened for either of these guys or even both. Yeah. I think the lack of touchdowns is, is a big issue too, in terms of getting into pro bowls. I mean, those, you know, sometimes I wonder if they're like wins in baseball where you, you, you wonder how um, significant they, they are in terms of, um, you know, what, gauging a player's performance. I think if you're, you're making plays on a down in down out basis, um, sometimes that's more valuable than than catching one pass for a touchdown. But touchdowns are still the thing that get people's um, you know eyes, uh, especially in in a fantasy football focused world. We all know we're all sitting there waiting for the touchdowns from our guys on Sunday afternoons, and so um, and there's just been such a lack of them in these Kenny Pickett, yeah. you know, Matt Canada offenses. You know, when you say Pat Frymuth only had two, well, how many did Kenny Pickett throw the whole season? How many Michigan Mich- Mich- <laughs> throw in the whole season? How many were available to Good be point. caught? Not many. Good and point. I think that's where a lot of people have made the argument that that uh, Russell Wilson went through 26 last year, and that would be huge for the Steelers. So I think it would be huge for a guy like Pat Frymuth or a guy like George Pickens. I think the question I have about um, Frymuth's candidacy is even if he is used well as a weapon this season, maybe, uh, you know, bumps up the explosiveness is he going to get the volume in a in a run focused um, passing game to get those totals? I, I think he it, it could be very much like a Kyle Pitts situation where people talk about him in fantasy as um, kind of a dud, but you know, in terms of doing the things that Atlanta needed to win, I think he's reviewed a little bit better than he is by the fantasy community. So is Pat Fryermuth going to be that guy that makes two or three key plays a game, but is not? like putting up Travis Kelsey type volume. I think that's a possible outcome for him for him. And that would be a step forward from him, but probably still prevent him from getting into Pro Bowl, you know, conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like we can't do this on offense without talking about all the young offensive linemen on the roster because Broderick Jones has been a starter. Um I think it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, one, you know, Zach Frazier and Troy Faltano, what's their playing, what's their snaps like. Um, but how quickly do they adapt to the NFL and how quickly does this Steelers offensive line get notoriety? Because that's another part of offensive line voting is a little bit trickier because there's no stats that you can just look at and say, oh, yeah, to uh, 1500 yards. That's that's totally that's that's totally there. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, over the years, I mean, Steelers fans saw that with Marquise Pouncey and David DeCastro, who were going to Pro Bowls in years where they weren't playing you know, at Pro Bowl level. They were kind of they were decent, but not, you know, better than the best of the AFC at the time. Um, but. I look at that and I, I I wonder, Adam, is like, what could what would it take for any of the Steelers' offensive linemen to get a Pro Bowl nod this year? Would it take a dominant ground game between Najee Harris and Jalen Warren and the, just the team in general to be playing at such a high level? Because it's it's not like you know if Broderick Jones has a zero percent pressure allowed rate that that's going to you know turn out turn all the heads because we've seen offensive to offensive linemen play very well like Marcus Gilbert was a great offensive lineman in some years for the Steelers and never got a pro bowl nod I just I think it might be more about team production than player production when it comes to some of these guys getting their dues in the pro bowl well I think the thing that probably went against Marcus Gilbert and a lot of guys who play well in the NFL is it's a very it's a a pedigree based thing and and people put you know closer eyes on first round picks and that's why I think Broderick Jones would have a chance if he's you know if you say zero pressures allowed in like eight consecutive games or something, that's something Pro Football Focus is going to like put in a tweet, tweet out, and, and um, you know, or, or some of these other analytics firms, and, and then you know it's going to get quote tweeted, and and then that's going to build a guy's you know, it, it, social media matters. I think in this situation, in terms of making the case where the statistics don't always necessarily. So I think it, that's what I think that's what it would take. It would take something so dominant that people end up talking about it around the league um, and and that, you know, because there's, there are bigger eyes on him than maybe a guy like a Marcus Gilbert, or let's say if Dan Moore Jr. hypothetically had the same type of production, 
I'm sure Dan Moore would get overlooked, but Broderick Jones, because he's got that first round pick pedigree, because he's on the Steelers, mm-hmm. um, I, I think he he probably has the most potential of that group to do it this year. Um, and really, I think he's going to be the first of the three to do it. Real quick, if there's one player in offense you pick to be an all-pro this year for the Steelers, who is it? Oof. I don't know, man. I think I think Broderick Jones has the easiest path. I, I think the Ooh. thing with George, I, I think George Pickens is the best player of the group. It's just such a competitive space. Um, it is. There's you know, so many great receiver wide receivers. that he could have a he could have a 1300, 1400 yard year and and still miss out. Um right. so that's that's why I'd lean against Pickens and toward Broderick Jones, just because because of what we're saying, it's it's more I think there's more luck involved with the, the offensive line selections. I think that's why I'd pick Broderick Jones, even though I think George Pickens is probably the more dominant and developed player overall. Hot take, hot take coming here. Najee Harris. With the improvement of the offensive line with a more well put together offense, I, I could see something like this happening, especially because who are the like, you know. Derrick Henry has been the boss of the, of the AFC running backs, but he's on a new team with the Ravens. Maybe that doesn't work out. So work out to put him up, up at the top, but with the Steelers increased focus in the run game with their increased investments in the offensive line, Najee Harris fit, finished seventh in rushing in the NFL last year. If he was to have a really strong year, like last year, Christian McCaffrey led the NFL with 1,459 yards. Could he be in that conversation if the, if the Steelers commit to the run game that that way and they and they get that kind of production and we see him do that and maybe he gets thirteen hundred plus and no one else does that and he has double digit touchdowns that could be really interesting I think that that could be an interesting thing there to see how that plays out but you also as you know with we were talking about with Jalen Warren how do the split how do the carries get split up how does that lead to the conversation but um, I was going with a hot take and maybe Najee Harris is the best option on offense well we don't got to talk about who could make it on defense because several players have made it on defense but i want to talk about the the new pro bowlers on defense we'll do that next here on the north shore drive podcast uh from the pittsburgh post because that chris carter here with adam bittner but first what reminds you the show is brought to you by the, the by mike's beer bar the best bar in all of pittsburgh when you go to mike's beer bar it's on the north shore it's on federal street right across the street from pnc park you can go there at any point in time they have outdoor seating so you get to you can enjoy the nice weather look at the skyline downtown they also have indoor seating with 20 televisions on inside so you can catch whatever sporting events you want including the paris olympics that are coming up um but you can also also while you're there try one of their 500 different available beers 300 of those beers are from the local pittsburgh area and 80 of those local beers are available on tap all day every day and you they're always switching new ones in and out so you're always getting new tastes every time you go to mike's beer bar they also have amazing food like their steak on a stone where you get your choice cut of steak brought to you on a heated stone and every time you cut a piece off that steak and press it into that stone you choose how well done you want every single bite it's the best bar in pittsburgh go to mike's beer bar today and when you get there tell them chris sent you Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Chris Carter, Adam Bittner, talking about the Steelers and players that we think could make their first Pro Bowls for the team uh, coming up this season. Defense, offense, it's, 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 you know, there's slim pickings as far as guys who have, who have made it. Defense doesn't have that problem. You got Cam Hayward, you got TJ Watt, you got Minka Fitzpatrick, those, Patrick Queen, even when you add, add it to the picture here. But there's also some players on this, on, on this roster who, we were a little shocked about who didn't make make the Pro Bowls, and I think the one that you and I were kind of the most surprised about was was uh, Alex Highsmith because he's been a producer for the Steelers. He's gotten the double digit sack seasons. He's been he's become a recognized edge rusher in the NFL, but he hasn't gotten that nod yet. And I know that that's, this is another situation where there's just a lot of competition. I mean, heck, your own teammate is T.J. Watt, and then in the same division you got Miles Garrett. So there's two Pro Bowl spots right there every, every single year. But I, I do think that this could be a year where Alex Highsmith, if he if him if he get, kind of breaks into it a little bit again, if the Steelers' offense puts up points, forces teams to be a little bit more desperate, maybe there's more to eat for both uh, uh, Watt and Highsmith. Do you think this is the year that he gets over the hump and gets the Pro Bowl nod, Adam? I don't know, man. I just I look at the year that T.J. Watt was hurt and that he was productive. Um, I mean, there certainly were times that that he was not, and and I don't think he was totally consistent in that 2022 season. But when you looked at the totals. Um, they were very solid and, and he was a threat that, that you know, opposing uh, blocking schemes had to account for. So 
I feel like if he was going to do it, that was going to be his best shot, right? When when you don't really when you're not really competing directly against TJ Watt, um, and I think at this point, if TJ Watt's healthy, it's going to take really like a, a big next step for him into like a level of dominance and not just being solid to get the attention that that would be required to to kind of get that Pro Bowl nod. I'm thinking like I don't know, 14, 15 sacks. Um, and I, do I think Alex Highsmith's going to get there with TJ Watt on his team? Probably not. And so I think. This is just a case of, you know, is Robin ever going to be recognized when Batman is still around? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is he stuck in TJ Watt's shadow? Is, is certainly a good question. And to your point, uh, in 2022, he had 14 and a half sacks. He also led the NFL with five forced fumbles and did not get a Pro Bowl nod, which was very interesting indeed there. Um, so uh, we'll see about Alex Highsmith. This could be a year where maybe he doesn't. I mean, he, had, he also had two interceptions last year, including a pick six uh, to go along with seven sacks. You know, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of recognition he gets. But other elsewhere on defense, the Steelers have also seen a rise of some young guys on their roster. And, you know, two guys in particular, Keanu Benton, Joey Porter Jr., I look at both of these guys and I was reading articles recently about redrafts because, you know, people are, every, every, we're, we're all kind of looking for topics right now. We're all kind of trying to, you know, keep, you'll find things to talk about, but um, in looking at people's redrafts in the NFL, both, you know, and when I looked across the board were being drafted higher than they were like Keanu Benton was definitely a first round pick. Joey Porter was definitely a first round pick. We both were second round picks for the Steelers in, in last year's draft. And it makes me wonder who is the more likely between the two to make that leap to get there. And I think a lot of people might say Joey Porter Jr., but I also think that Keanu Benton could be a very underrated uh, guy coming into this season that he could be a major uh, contributor to the Steelers defense. Yeah, we talked with about Broderick Jones and how sometimes it requires that that kind of buzzy, you know, status among a certain class of people, like the the, mm -hmm. the, the film watchers, the pro football focus types. And I think Keanu Benton has that going for him. Um, you know, when, whenever he has a solid performance, it's not going on under the radar. And I think it's oftentimes with with especially interior defensive linemen, it's easy for them to go under the radar. So if you're getting any buzz at all, you're going to be on people's radars when you get to the end of the year for these. Um, you know, Pro Bowl and All Pro selections. So, I, I like his chances. It's not that I don't like Joey Porter Jr.'s. Um, I think Joey Porter Jr. has the name recognition that people are always going to be watching him. Um, you know, because of his dad, because of that as association, because Joey Porter is a name that has been in Pro Bowl circles before. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it was his dad, I, I think he's got a solid chance. I just, it, again, as we've talked about with receiver. Uh, corner is just also a very competitive position. It is. Can Joey Porter take that step to be, you know, a top one, two, three type of guy in the AFC? Um, that's that's the conversation. I think he has that potential. But if I had to pick who I think is more likely, I think the bar is just a little bit lower for Keanu Benton. I, I think so too. You know, and like there are really good interior pass rushers. Like Chris Jones is just a perennial pick there. Um, but to your point, there, there's a lot of because of the the rise in today's passing game in the NFL. Corner is a highly competitive position to get recognition in. And I think that's a really interesting point there. I want to pose one other name to you, and this is me thinking a little bit outside the box here. But what about Deshaun Elliott? Because if he is the strong safety that that you know, I think he could be in this Steelers defense. He could end up making a lot of tackles, getting targeted a bunch, and being able to make some plays on the football. Not that to say that he'll be the best safety or anything. I also think that Mika Fitzpatrick is a guy that you know he might live in his shadow a little bit. But his role is going to be to free up Mika Fitzpatrick to do all the free safety things, to be able to kind of patrol the middle of the field, bait the quarterback into big mistakes there. And if Elliott is coming up making big hits. You know, making plays on the making plays on the ball, helping in slot coverage, helping against tight ends, and he does a decent job at that. I wonder if he'll get a nod this year and could be a, a, a sort of dark horse to make a Pro Bowl at a strong at the strong safety position. Yeah, I just wonder if that's that's going to be the kind of thing that is is recognized nationally, right? Um, I think we could probably sit here, you know, after games every week, and and we could all say, man, Deshaun Elliott was great this week. He was very solid. He did the things. He freed up Minka Fitzpatrick to do X, Y, and Z. And still, you know, it's just something we talk about in Pittsburgh. And that happens a lot, right? There's lots of topics where we know things, but the rest of the country does not. And so is Deshaun Elliott going to generate the turnovers necessary to, you know, get on highlight shows, 
um, generate some buzz, you know, on social media. Cause I think that's what it's going to require. It's going to require other guys knowing how solid he is. And it's, I think it's just hard to do that at that position unless you're making the splashy plays. I hear you on that. All right, let's do the all pro question for this, but we're going to, we're going to make it so you can't cheat. No TJ Watt, no Minka Fitzpatrick, no Cam Hayward. If you're taking those three out of, cons- out of consideration, guys who've been all pros, who is the who is your person to be an all pro from this defensive roster that you think is most likely of the other guys? I'm going to go with Benton for similar reasons that I mentioned before. Mm. I just ooh, it's it's going to be so tough for Joey Porter Jr. to to climb to that level of all pro uh, with all the very solid corners in the NFL. I think it would it would require him to kind of build on on the statistical notoriety that he built, you know, last season. He'd have to be like a true shutdown guy every single week. Uh, and that's just that's just such a high bar. He could have a phenomenal season. I think still fall short of that. Um, I think with Benton, it's it, again the bar is just a little bit lower. I think I'm going to take Alex Highsmith out of consideration because you're like you said, T.J. Watt and Miles Garrett's the starting point for that whole conversation. Right. So um, I, I think Keanu Benton, especially this season, until Joey Porter Jr. has built more of the reputation, I'm going to say Keanu Benton's the most likely. I think Benton's a really good pick there. Again, I'm gonna try to go to the dark horse here, but what about what about Patrick Queen? Because if Patrick Queen plays really well in the middle of all these other talents, like let's say Keanu Benton steps up and the defensive line, Cam Hayward returns healthy, they're playing really strong. Joey Porter Jr. and the corners are playing strong, the safeties, and Patrick Queen is just sort of captaining it in all in the middle. Not that he's the captain of the team, but he, he you know, the quarterback. He's the, and we we've, we've got it confirmed. He's going to wear the green dot all season. If he's sort of quarterbacking this defense, and it is one of the more elite defenses in the NFL, and naturally a linebacker, he makes a lot of plays in it. I could see him getting some getting some recognition. Now, again, it's a dark horse. There's a lot of great linebackers out there, including the, the better of the Ravens linebackers last year, which was Roquan Smith. There's Fred. I Warner. think. I think Chris. I think he's going to benefit from that because everyone's watching that. That sure. ri- it's like a budding rivalry, and I think people are going to be watching, and that's why Patrick Queen's status is going to be elevated. So I, I, you know, I like that pick. That, thank, thank you. Yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking here is that if he if he comes out of the shadow of Roquan Smith and plays extremely well for the Steelers, and if the Steelers have a better defense. There might be people that look at that and say, you know what, he's 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 doing his thing over there, and now he's a leader. Whereas you know everyone was wondering what was his what was his uh, his ceiling there in Baltimore while he was playing next to Roquan Smith. So all that being said, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, there's a lot of upside pot- potential for this Steelers roster, and I think that's why there's so many people excited for training camp, which is less than two weeks away, by the way. And will we have you cover that for all here from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette? Adam, thanks so much for joining us talking Steelers. Don't go away, fans. We still got to talk about Paul Skeens and the crazy no-hit seven innings that he threw. We'll talk about that with Andrew Destin next here on the North Shore Drive Podcast. We're back here on the North Shore Drive Podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Andrew Destin, one of our great Pittsburgh Pirate beat writers here at the Post-Gazette. And Andrew's on the road here. He's been covering the minor league side of things for the Pirates. But, Andrew, I know you weren't there to, to watch it live, uh, you know, in person, but Paul Skeens delivers another fantastic outing on Thursday, and it just continues along the line of all the amazing things he's done for, for the Pirates this season. And now... Everyone was pointing out, and I guess I couldn't not see it on on my on my Twitter uh, yes yesterday. But now he's in a in a club all alone with Nolan Ryan, and that's a pretty good name to be listed next to when it comes to pitching. Yeah, first off, I mean, yeah, for that start was truly incredible that we saw Thursday night or Thursday afternoon. But um, yeah, I mean, seven. So let's see, seven innings of no hit ball over 11 strikeouts, and now in doing that, he joins Nolan Ryan as one of only two pitchers to ever have starts in a season with no hits given up and 11 or more strikeouts. That's the list. It's him and Nolan Ryan. Um, That's insane. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, right, those starts from Nolan Ryan are true no hitters. They're complete games, and Paul Skeens hasn't gotten a chance to do that, which I'm sure we can discuss that further, the idea to pull him after seven innings and 99 pitches. But um, I I made this comment to Noah yesterday on our podcast, and to me, Mm -hmm. when the incredible becomes mundane, that's when you know you're in the presence of excellence, and I think that's what we're seeing with Paul Skeens. It's almost to the point where this isn't surprising because it's expected. 
he's been so good. He's been so consistently elite that it's hard to truly be amazed at this point. And I think that's where my mind went to after checking out the Brewers start, looking at the stats, looking what he put together. Like, he expects this of himself because of what he's put into his arsenal, what he's put into the repertoire in terms of making those pitches as different as they are, how much they move, how much he's trained his physique to be able to throw this hard and do it so consistently and so deep into a start. Like, this is what he was, I want to say, designed to do, but it feels like it. And that's why I would say um, being surprised is not my emotion anymore. It's more in awe, I guess, is the way of putting it. No, I feel you on that. I mean, it, it's it's something to awe at is the way the way that the way that he plays right now. And I think everyone's kind of just just, just standing back and be like, hey, they're, they're they're witnessing greatness right now from a from a rookie phenom in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and, and I think that's the get guy, you know, kind of gets into, you know, you guys talked about this on your show too, but you know, the 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 the, the angst or the the arguments that happen in Pittsburgh when he has a no hitter through seven innings and they're pulling him uh when it, when it when, and then they of course they lose the no hitter they ended up winning the game but you know the the question of the value of hey like that would have been a historic amazing moment if he goes if he goes and they, the, does has a no hitter as you know as a rookie and everything there but it's still keeping the eye on the bigger picture now the picture now of they need to keep they need to manage his innings as best as possible and it's moments like that where you can't if you break you can't break the code that you've set up for yourself so that you can still have Paul Skeens pitching late in the season without realistically pushing the limits of his body uh as far as you know how much he's going to be asked to throw this season. Yeah, and it's not just late in the season too, right? Like it's the context of hey, what did Paul Skeens do his last time out? Mm-hmm. Oh, he just set a career high for pitches in the game. I believe he threw 107. Um What's the context here? It's not coming on six days rest or seven days rest. It's a regular turn through the rotation. What else? Um, You just saw Jared Jones go on the injured list with an injury after he had a start skipped and went back out there and messed up his side. Like, and oh, what's Jared Jones? He's another one of your 22-year-old rookie pitchers that you care deeply about. You have all those factors put into play in addition to the idea that you're trying to win a series. Like, it's a one nothing game. This isn't, I'm not saying Paul Skeens by any means is a charity case. Couldn't be further from it. But it's one thing if it's a 7 nothing ball game, you have some wiggle room and, oh, you know, let's let the guy go out there and get it. And if he doesn't, then we can ramp somebody up in the bullpen and they can win the game 7-2 to two, and everybody's happy because they gave it their all. Like, it's a one nothing ball game. It's not like the offense is giving the Pirates much room for error. And right. Colin Holderman and Aroldis Stratman have been excellent. So, yeah, you turn it over to those guys because – that's what you pay them to do. That's why they're fresh. That's why they're there. It's a one nothing game. Go win it. Um, so I have no problem with it at all. But to your point, Chris, yeah, it's it's tough a little bit to watch just in the sense of you want to watch a guy go get it, go out there and try for the no-hitter and get his chance. He obviously didn't get it. Um, but I, I, I really can't struggle with the decision-making process behind it at all. Yes, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I wanted to delve into your off-the-bat article that you wrote for this this week and it it kind of dove into what the pirates are trying to do with the upcoming draft strategy and it, you really get the sense I mean, even from the title that a lot of this is going to be about you know continuing to build out the farm system and they get that that's part of baseball right like mm-hmm. you you don't find too many rookies that are going to be coming up right 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 away uh in most drafts like you know paul schemes comes around once in a lifetime uh you know but at the same time I do think there's a question as far as how many people are they actually going to be even beyond just the draft, but how many, how many players are they going to be actually be able to bring up to support uh, what's going to be the upcoming era of Paul Skeens for the pirates? Because to me, that is the biggest thing here. It's the reality that you probably have a five year window of having Paul Skeens on your roster uh, before he goes into free agency and makes huge money some, somewhere else. You know, unless they find a way to pull it out, that'd be amazing if they did, and it'd be a huge story if they pulled it out. But assuming that you're that you're trying to capitalize on this period right now, you'd want to try to use your assets to load up and to have the chance to compete in these in these upcoming years. And it, it kind of seems like just looking at what options are out there right now, it might be more about, as your article suggested, building depth on the roster rather than building up the starting caliber talent that can make them a better playoff team. Yeah, and I think that's, and speaking generally, you look at this draft board, like this is not the 2023 draft board where you had four different guys that were legitimate number one candidates at the top. 
and also where the Pirates are picking being at number nine, like you're not going to be able to get that impact guy who can immediately help the big league roster. I think best case scenario, whoever you draft, let's say it's a college guy, and I'd say that's more likely than not. And that's not because I'm hearing anything. It's just by nature of who the most coveted guys are at the top of the draft boards in the top 10, that if they get a good college bat that falls to them, that's probably the route that they're going to go. Um, they might not say as much publicly, but that feels like the right path. Um, but on that note, I mean, anybody they're going to get, nobody is truly, truly big league ready the way that Wyatt Langford was last year getting mm-hmm. drafted for the Rangers. And now obviously he's in Texas and that's a quick turnaround. Or, you know, the way that Paul Skeens, it was just, you know, truly a unicorn once in a lifetime type of thing with drafting a pitcher who gets there within a calendar year, et cetera. I bring all those points up to say that, yeah, I can't fault Ben Charrington for the strategy because the truth is that no matter who they get, they're probably not going to be there till 2026. So to handicap yourself and say, oh, let's try and get somebody who's going to be here as quickly as possible, that might be cheating the process rather than getting who's actually the best guy available at that spot. I don't think you're going to be able to find too many reinforcements through this draft. I think what you're going to do is get projectable guys Mm. who can maybe be flipped next year for, hey, this is how we can retool the current MLB roster for 2025, 26, 27. Eventually, you're going to have to part ways with guys in the farm system. The issue is, how are you going to go about doing that? What type of guys is that going to look like? And at the end of the day, this is not a farm system that's deep in position players. At some point, you just have to address that need. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is a draft where they kind of go that route. It certainly would be interesting uh, how, the, how that'll play out. I want to wrap up by going back to their final three games for the All-Star break here. They're on the road in Chicago playing the White Sox, who's been one of the rougher teams, uh, or having one of the rougher seasons in, ba- in baseball right now. But... Looking at this series, Andrew, the Pirates are three games below 500, and now they get three games against a, a team like this. Uh, you know, to me, I look at that and I see opportunity knocking for the Pirates to follow through, actually, you know, do some damage. They're they're also only two and a half games back in in the in the wild card. I think back to the best times that I remember of my adult watching life that the Pirates was was uh, you know under uh, McClendon and. Um, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, but it was when they were when the tw- in the mid 2010s when they were making their pushes, and oftentimes they would make these strong pushes right before the All Star break that got them into better playoff position. And granted, they would fall off right after the All Star break and have to bu- build back. But I, it just makes me look at it. There's this is an opportunity for the Pirates to do that for themselves here. Do you think this is a chance for them to get a sweep going into and and feel strong going into the All Star break, or do you see their problems and inconsistencies at the plate? kind of making this a lot harder than what it should be. I think it's going to be a little bit of the latter. Um, and oh, especially, especially so when you look at who the White Sox are going to be starting. One of the starts is going to be Garrett Crochet, who is perhaps the biggest name in baseball in terms of trade market guys. You know, that's a name that I'm sure mm. any of the 29 other teams would love to get their hands on in Garrett Crochet. But, um, but yeah, him, um, it, it's not a great team per se, but facing him is going to be tough. Um Luis Robert is no slouch in the lineup. Tommy Pham is no slouch. So, like, this White Sox team is by no means a complete one, but it's not one to be taken lightly. My best prediction here is the Pirates take two out of three, and all told, it's still a very productive road trip where you win four out of six. I think asking for a sweep is maybe a little bit much. I could be very wrong, but I say all of that to say that don't get the hopes up too, too much. Crochet is going to be a fun one to watch um, for any baseball fan, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it should, in theory, be one of the easier series of the year. But, hey, we saw it in late April and early May. The Pirates got swept by the A's. So they're not above playing down to any caliber of opponent, but also certainly not above playing up to any caliber of opponent. So I'm curious to see how this series goes all around heading into the break. Same here. It'll be very interesting. Andrew, thanks so much for all the work that you do for the Post-Gazette, and thank you for joining us here on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's North Shore Drive podcast. Thanks also to Adam Bittner for joining us earlier. We'll be back Monday with more here on the North Shore Drive podcast, on your favorite podcasting apps, and on YouTube. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. See you after the weekend here for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on the North Shore Drive podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.